Thank you very much, Richard, also for your kind introduction. My name is Dörte and I'm working at the Regulatory Affairs Department as a Food Law Advisor. And today I would like to um, take you all on a journey um, through allergen labeling within and also outside of the European Union. The focus of today's webinar will be on allergens as intentionally added to ingredients. During the session, we are going to start off with the importance of allergen labeling. We then move further and look at prepacked foods and their regulatory background. We also look at the specified allergens and their labeling in the European Union and also in third countries. We will then also have a glimpse on non-prepacked foods within the European Union before we then briefly see how is the situation uh, with the precautionary statement. So why is allergen labeling actually so important? Allergen labeling is, in, is inherent to uh, one of the core principles of food law, which is food safety. From a consumer perspective, it is of utmost importance to be informed about your choice you're going to um, be making. And in this regard, in regards to allergen labeling, especially about substances, that may cause, um, for example, hypersensitivity reactions, and then could also um, be a health risk. Therefore, non-compliance um, in terms of allergy labeling would result in serious consequences or could result. It could, uh, for example, um, be leading to uh, recalls from the market so enforcement actions and also to relabeling needs and could also come with uh, fines and or charges depending on the jurisdiction you're moving. Before having a look at the current situation within the European Union, I found that it's quite worth having a look at how uh, we got where we are right now. So have a look at the legislative history. Whereas um, in the directive from 2000, Directive 2013, um, we just have a provision uh, which declares that a list of ingredients has to be given. We then had a directive in 2003 which introduced um, that a, the obligation of a list of ingredients together with the ingredients with allergenic effect. It also comes with the obligation and to use the obligation to make a clear reference in the ingredient's name to such ingredients with allergenic effect. This list was then amended by another back then directive. Provisions regarding the presentation of allergenic um, substances or products were not included on, in any of the um, before mentioned directives. This situation has um, changed quite some with the regulation 1169 from 2011 on the provision of food, of food information to consumers, which is also known and called the FIC. Within this, within this regulation, we have in chapter four, mandatory food information, and then more precisely, in Article 9, Literal C, we have stipulated that one of those information which are mandatory to be given are any ingredients or processing aids listed in Annex 2 or derived from a substance or product listed in Annex 2 causing allergies or intolerances used in the manufacture or preparation of a food and still present in the finished product, even if in an altered form. So this information now became mandatory and we also have that annex with the substances and um, products which I'm now going to go through. This slide shows the specified allergens as mentioned in Annex 2 which I trust most of you um, as we could see from the poll um, are familiar with within the European Union. So this list shows the 14 substances and products causing allergies or intolerances within the European Union. 
Um, as indicated with the asterisk and the little cross, um, the labeling, the allergy labeling requirement generally applies equally also to dairy weights of the 14 allergenes, so that the allergenic potential is assumed to remain. However, a defined list of dairy weights are excluded from the allergen labeling requirements. Um, this is because there has been data demonstrating the lack of their allergenic potential. And that can exactly be seen from the um, full list provided in Annex 2 of the FIC. As can also be seen, and where we will probably come back to at the later point, is that we are having cereals containing gluten and not gluten under number one. And in this regard, it's also worth mentioning that the only threshold is for sulfur dioxide and sulfide, and that there are no thresholds for the other 13 allergenes below which allergen labeling would not be required. Being aware of those 14 allergenes and or substances and products, Article 21 of the FIC then also lets us know how to actually present those allergenes. The difference Article 21 is making is um, between foods with an ingredient list and foods without an ingredient list. For foods with an ingredient list, the FIC stipulates that we have to have a clear reference to the name of the substance or product as listed in the annex, which we have just had a look on, and that the name of the substance or product as listed in this annex has to be emphasized by a typeset clearly distinguishing from the rest of the ingredient list. This can, for example, be by means of the font, the style, or the background color. Whereas for foods without an ingredient list, um, the indication has to be made with the word contains followed by the name of the substance or product, again, as listed in Annex 2. It's uh, crucial to note that the indication has to be made for each ingredient or processing aid concerned. And then we also have the option given in the FIC that an indication could be committed omitted, uh, where the name of the food clearly refers to the substance or product concerned. However, this um, should be used with great care and also always in consideration of the market that you're going into. With this information from the FIC from a European Union perspective as kind of a base, um, I would now like to have a look how allergen regulations outside of the European Union are handled. For example, in India, there is no regulation in place which deals with allergens in food, whereas, for example, in China, um, we do have a regulation dealing with this topic. At the same time, the labeling of allergens is voluntary. In markets where we do have regulations, um, such as the ones listed here, we would then need to take a look at what are the substances which are considered allergenic, which are considered allergies in those specific markets. We found, for example, that in Taiwan, mango would be considered an allergen. In Korea, it would be buckwheat, pork, peaches, tomatoes, chicken, and beef, amongst others. In Russia, it's uh, worth mentioning that aspartame and aspartame acylfame salt would be an allergen. In the United States, one would need to consider that, for example, coconut is an allergen, which would differ from the allergen list um, that we have in the European Union. Um, likewise, in Brazil, natural latex is listed as an allergen. And yet to be sure that the allergen we're looking at and we potentially have in our product um, is the one that is also referred to in that foreign legislation, it is important to be aware that there might be um, different defini definitions um, behind the allergens that we're looking at. For example, in comparison with the United States in the category of seafood, Within the European Union, we have those two um, numbers, crustaceans and products thereof, and mollusk and products thereof, 
Whereas in the United States, we have crustacean shellfish. This would cover crab, lobster, and shrimp. However, oysters, clams, mussels, and scallops would not be considered allergens. And another example for a different definition behind the allergens listed would be, for example, for cereals. We have seen that in the European Union we have cereals containing gluten, and namely wheat, rye, barley, oats, or the hybridized uh, strains and products there. In the United States, um, we find wheat as um, the allergens for the cereals. This means that wheat would be covered, whereas rye, barley, and oats would not be considered allergens there. If we have identified the allergen, we share about the definition and um, come to the conclusion that we need to um, consider how to label compliantly in the uh, market. Here, for example, again in the United States, uh, we would uh, need to take a look at uh, the provisions that potentially deal with this subject. In the United States, in contrast to the European Union, the allergen can be included within the contained statement adjacent to the ingredient list or in the ingredient list in brackets. We have included some examples uh, just to see how it may look like or look like on the market. We will then also find um, how the regulation actually provides for the presentation of these um, statements that you could choose from. So for both options, the characteristics um, are given. The contains would need to start with the capital C. We have a letter size prescribed, and we have the same use uh, in the list of ingredients. And we then also have stipulated that the color needs to be in contrast with the background. Having a look at the allergen labeling regulations in a different market, for example, in Brazil. Also in Brazil, we have um, a range of statements that depending on um, the case would need to be used. It's one of those three statements. The statement needs to be um, immediately below the list of ingredients. And also in Brazil, there is characteristics which um, regarding the presentation which would need to be followed to be compliant. So, for example, that the capital, uh, that the letters are um, shown in capital, that they're bolded, and that the colors in contrast with the background. We then also have a minimum height prescribed of those statements. It's worth, um, at this uh, point, it's also worth mentioning that in Argentina, the font size requirement and the format requirement are the same. However, in Argentina, the word allergic um, would be considered a generic expression that refers not only to food allergies, but all sorts of allergies, and therefore may be, mis may be a misleading statement or cause unnecessary alarm or panic to the consumer, and therefore should not be used. Finally, there might also be differences depending on the product type. Here, for example, um, for alcoholic beverages. In case of alcoholic beverages, um, there might be some exemptions in terms of the labeling of allergens. In Japan, for example, alcoholic beverages would be exempt from allergen labeling. In the United States, it's voluntary. In Canada, an allergen labeling um, is not required on bourbon whiskey and standardized alcoholic beverages. And for example, in Australia, cereal allergens would not be required on standardized beers or spirits, whereas all other allergens uh, are required to be declared. In relation to the topic allergens in food um, and allergen labeling, we are often um, asked questions or receive queries regarding gluten. Even though gluten is not an allergen, um, and in the European Union its labeling is voluntary, uh, we have included a slide 
to show the approaches taken in other uh, jurisdictions. For example, in the market of Brazil, um, a statement has to be uh, has to be present on all food as a pre preventive measure for the celiac disease. So it has to be indicated whether or not um, this food actually contains gluten. In South Africa, um, we have a provision regarding significant cereals, so-called significant cereals. The indication here would need to be in the ingredient list and would need to be specified in the name of the ingredient concerned with the word gluten indicated in parentheses. And in Israel, we have a kind of threshold. So if the gluten content is above 20 ppm, an indication would need to be found in the ingredient list as well. Um, and it would need to be the gluten containing component followed by a statement contains gluten in Hebrew. Having gone through the basics of the um, FIC provisions and also seeing some differences in other markets worldwide, in the FIC we also find um, provisions regarding non-prepacked foods. Here, Article 44 um, provides for national measures for non-prepacked food. In the FIC itself, we do not find the definition for non-prepacked food. Article 44 mentions without packaging, uh, which could be read in relation to Article 2, subparagraph 2, litera E, where prepacked food is defined. And it says, packed on sales premises at consumer's request, and prepacked for direct sale. Generally speaking, we're therefore looking at situations in daily counters, shops where food is displayed, loose, or catering establishments. Having a closer look at this article, we do also find provisions regarding the allergen labeling. So first of all, in Litra A, it's made clear that the provision of allergen information is mandatory, just as for prepacked foods. We then can also see that the means of making such information available and the form of expression and presentation um, would be subject to national measures so to the member states of the European Union. For those measures, we have taken a look within the European Union, and such measures are, for example, in place in Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, and Greece, also in Ireland, Luxembourg, Poland, Spain, and in the United Kingdom. In order to give a bit more insight um, into one of those national measures and how they're structured, we would like to take you um, into the German legislation for having a look. And the German legislation um, differentiates between prepacked food for immediate sale and safe self-service, and then we also have prepacked food for immediate sale and not for self-service, packaged on consumers or mass caterers' requests, offered without packaging. Depending on the category, then there are a specific provisions, for example, regarding the possibility to indicate the information on tags or menus or posters, and also regarding the possibility to inform the consumer orally under certain conditions. For the non-prepacked food, it's also it's therefore very important to decide which case, um, the case you're looking um, at, falls under to then see what kind of requirements you need to meet. And finally, we also would like to dedicate some time to the so-called precautionary may contain allergen information. Here, within the European Union, um, we understand that it would be information on possible and unintentional presence of allergens. Under the FIC, such statement is not mandatory at the moment. The FIC also provides for implementing acts which are to be adopted by the Commission. Um, to date, such implementing acts have not been um, published. 
such information and such um, such labeling and its considerations would also need to be uh, looked at for other markets outside of the European Union. We could, for example, have the situation where it's voluntary. It could also be mandatory or at least regulated, for example, in Brazil, where the may contain statement is regulated. Or we could also have the case, actually, where such statements are actually not permitted. In summary, we therefore have um, for both non-prepacked and prepacked food within the European Union the situation that allergen information is mandatory. It's mandatory to provide such information. Looking outside of the European Union, uh, we could see that there's different approaches which are taken. It might be that regulations don't deal with this topic at all. It might be that they do and it's voluntary or mandatory. We have to consider that the list of specified allergens where regulations ex exist might differ from the ones we are familiar with. In this regard, we would also need to see what kind of definitions um, are in place for each of the specified allergens, and finally see how everything is put into practice when it comes to the labeling and presentation of the allergen information. For non prepacked food, there is the, this is provided for in the FIC, whereas the presentation then comes down to the member states and national measures. And here, seen from the example for Germany, it's a case by case um, assessment of the situation to see which information would need to be given and in which manner this could be done compliantly. At this point, I would really very much thank you for, for listening to the webinar on allergen labeling. Okay, brilliant. Um, thank you very much, daughter. That was a, uh, a fantastic overview of um, allergen legislation. I think it's clear there are several different approaches uh, around the world, so I think you did a great job of explaining it. Um, some of you have probably got questions, so we'll come back to those a little bit later on. If you want to send them in, then now's uh, probably a good time to start so that we can um, come back to them in a couple of minutes. But uh, just before uh, we get there, there's a few things I wanted to go through to uh, help ensure you can find out more about uh, regulatory affairs. Um, a lot of you will be subscribed to our news feeds already. Uh, we've got several of them on uh, several different subjects. You can opt into them at any time or, uh, or leave the, uh, the distribution list at any time. We have got one on legislation, which is uh, clearly the most relevant for this particular group, but um, depending on your area of interest, you can sign up to any one of them. There's a link uh, at the bottom of the page there. Um, a couple of publications that we uh, raise awareness of through um, the Newsfeed system is that it's Food Law Alert, which is uh, a member-only publication and is a summary of all of the, the latest uh, regulatory changes. That's available to members only um, every two weeks, but you need to be on the Newsfeed list to, uh, to subscribe to that. Um, Food Law Notes is a similar publication, but that's uh, available on subscription, so you would need to, uh, to inquire about uh, that, and it's, uh, it's a paid-for service. Um, for, for those of you that are members, we also have the member interest groups, which are effectively uh, networking events for member companies, again based on several different subjects. Uh, one of the topics of discussion at some of these uh, groups is uh, regulatory affairs. So um, if you come to a MIG or you uh, sign up to a, a MIG to receive um, all of the documentation, um, you can keep up to date with uh, topical issues, you can get the presentations, if you attend you can network with uh, other members as well. Um, they're a great uh, forum for keeping up to date, but if you want to be involved in that, you need to uh, join the uh, member interest groups. And it has got its own website, so you can find out more information um, about any one of them. If you use social media, then uh, Camden BRI has several uh, different accounts. So uh, we have Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. The links are there. You can uh, follow us on any one of those uh, platforms. So I think we've, uh, we've reached the end of the, the session today. Um, so uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you to everybody for, uh, for joining us. And also thank you very much to uh, Dorsa for her um, fantastic presentation. And also we have got a regulatory affairs team that uh, you can contact at uh, any time. So uh, uh, please get in touch um, 
um, in due course if you'd like us to, uh, to answer a question that you have. So uh, thanks very much for attending. Uh, we will make the slides available uh, later on, so uh, keep an eye out for those. And uh, we hope to see you at some of our future um, events, whether they be conferences, seminars, or, or other webinars similar to this one. Um, if you sign up to the news feed system, we'll, uh, we'll keep you up to date. So thanks for attending. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and all the best. Thank you very much.